Okay, everyone, so we're continuing with our look into um, thermodynamics um, at a term called molar enthalpy. Okay, so we already mentioned about what enthalpy is, right? So it's a change in energy throughout some sort of chemical process or chemical reaction, right? And just kind of recapping what we talked about. So delta H, if we are dealing with an endothermic process, has a positive value. The delta H of an exothermic would have a negative value if we're dealing with um, energy being released from the system. And of course, delta H is always in relation to the system. Okay, so obviously our focus for um, looking at enthalpies here is going to be at chem with chemical reactions. So anytime you have a reaction, right, you have reactants uh, becoming products, right? So you might have, you know, A plus B becoming C. So in order for the reactants to become products, right, the bonds have to be broken, right? So the bonds that are in the beginning particles must break, okay? So energy has to actually be absorbed from the surroundings in order for that to happen. It takes energy in order to break a chemical bond. To form the product bonds, the new bonds that are being made, uh, energy is actually released from the system into the surroundings. So if we're looking at it from the system point of view, it's an endothermic process to break the bonds and an exothermic process to um, create the new bonds that are found in the products. So the overall delta H for a chemical reaction is actually going to be the difference between these two processes. If more energy had to go into breaking the bonds than what came out from the formation of the new bonds, then the entire process would be deemed as being endothermic. If more energy was released as a result of the new bond formation, then had to go in for the breaking of the bonds, then the entire process would be deemed as exothermic. So really when we're talking about endothermic exothermic reactions, we're looking at this entire thing, the energy to break bonds and as well as the energy needed to um, released when new bonds are formed. Okay, so this is um, another one of those potential energy diagrams. So we saw this in the last um, lesson. So you have here a couple of different terms. So the y-axis here is enthalpy in this case. So sometimes this is also known as um, potential energy. Okay, potential energy, same thing as the enthalpy change. So um, in terms of this value right here, this bar, this is the potential energy that the reactants hold within their bonds with them just um, existing, right? So there is potential in the energy here. So actually this reaction that they're showing you is the combustion for um, methane. So here we have methane and here we have oxygen. So the energy that has to go in, so here is our energy input, which makes this an endothermic step, right? This is the energy needed to break those bonds. Right, so going back here, this is the initial breaking of the chemical bonds. So for this methane and those oxygens to break apart, that takes this amount of energy, right? whatever the case may be. Let's make up a number here. So let's say um, 25 joules worth of energy to break those bonds had to go in. So up here, this is obviously just showing you or representing those atoms once the bonds are broken. Now this line coming down is representing the energy that is released when the new bonds are formed. So here's our carbon dioxide and our water products. So again, this black line here is representing the potential energy of those products. So let's say the energy released ended up being, let's say, um, I don't know, negative 35 joules. Okay, so 25 joules went in, 35 joules came out. So the overall delta H here is essentially these two processes combined. 
So we have the 25 joules going in, the 35 joules coming out. So overall, more energy came out than what had to go in. So this overall would be deemed as an exothermic reaction because the delta H for the process overall is a negative value. Okay, so when we're talking about the enthalpy of chemical reactions, we are determining the delta H for the overall chemical change. Okay, so we can talk about it as step by step, like we have here. So here's step one, step two. So breaking bonds, making bonds. But when we're referring to the delta H of the overall reaction, it's the entire chemical change. Okay, so what accounts for this overall uh, value? Like what makes it different? What makes the combustion of methane different from the combustion of ethane? Okay, so there's a couple of things or factors that come into play here. So the first thing is the state of the reactants and products. So for example, let's say I'm doing a chemical reaction with, um, um, let's say, magnesium that's in the liquid state versus magnesium in the solid state. The difference between those two, or the energy needed for those two to react are going to be different. So the state that the matter is in will have an impact on the amount of energy change. The second factor that comes in is the amount of reactants and products that are involved. So if I'm trying to produce one mole of product, it's going to have a different energy requirement than if I were trying to produce 10 moles of product. So the amount of reactant you have to work with or product that you are intending to produce is going to have a factor in terms of the energy requirement or input or output, vice versa. Okay, so here's a little reminder. We've already reviewed this. A negative delta H value for a reaction is considered to be an overall exothermic. A positive delta H is considered to be endothermic. So this delta H R, remember that this little symbol that's here is just representing what type of delta H this is. R is just short for reaction. So it's just saying this is the delta H of a chemical reaction. So if you remember from the last one, you could see um, delta H of vaporization or delta H of melting, right? So whenever you see delta H R, it's not being specific. It's just saying delta H of a reaction. Okay, now you might see specific delta H's. So for example, you may see delta H of a combustion reaction. So Delta H R is just in general reactions, but you can actually have what type of specific reaction that is. You may even see Delta H of um, neutralization. Okay, so there are gonna be different Delta H values you look at. Just remember that that lower um, subscript here is just kind of indicating what Delta H are we referring to. Okay, but in general, chemical reactions, we tend to just keep it general. Okay, so let's talk about this term molar enthalpy. So we reviewed enthalpy. Um, we looked at different processes that happen within a chemical reaction, right? So bonds are breaking, bonds are forming. Um, but now we're gonna be more specific in terms of quantities. So when we're talking about the enthalpy of a chemical reaction, we've already mentioned, we talked about this here, that the amount that is reacting is a factor that comes into play. So when we're referring to molar enthalpy of a reaction, we're talking about one mole of something. Okay, so it could be one mole of a reactant. It could be one mole of a product. It depends on the reaction and it depends what the focus is of that reaction. Because of course you can have more than one reactant. You can have more than one product. So the molar enthalpy can be referring to different things it kind of depends on what the goal is or the focus is of the question. So um, the molar enthalpy in general, right, if we were talking about it, it would be the energy per mole. So if I have two moles of propane that is going to do combustion, that's going to release twice as much energy than if I were to do one mole of propane combusting. And that should kind of make sense. I have double the amount of propane like double the amount of reactant. So the amount of energy that's gonna be released is gonna be double the amount, right? If I had five moles of propane that was doing a combustion, 
then I'm going to have now five times the amount of energy that's going to be released. So once you know the molar enthalpy, and typically um, you could express it as joules per mole, but actually the most common um, unit for molar enthalpy is kilojoules per mole. So once you know the kilojoules per mole value, you can actually adapt it depending on how many moles you have that's reacting. And we'll see a couple of examples with that. Okay, so let's say here we have a general, here we have a synthesis of water reaction. Okay, so we have hydrogen making oxygen making um, water, okay? And we have an energy value here. So if you recall from our first lesson, that if the energy amount is on the product side, this is indicating that this is an exothermic process, right? So this means that 241.8 kilojoules of energy is released in this reaction. So if this was an endothermic process, that number value would actually be on the reactant side. So this is a product, right, meaning it is part of the release from that process. Okay, so when you're looking at this reaction, this actually tells us the molar enthalpy for a few things. So if you have no numbers to go by, right, so this is not telling us, um, you know, we have five grams of hydrogen or 100 grams of water, it's literally just giving us a balanced chemical equation and an energy value. Technically, the molar information comes from the coefficients. Okay, so if there's no coefficient in front, remember that's as if there is a number one. So this 241.8 kilojoules is the molar enthalpy for water because for every one mole worth of water, 241.8 kilojoules of energy is going to be released, okay? But this is also the molar enthalpy for a reactant here. So this is the molar enthalpy for one mole worth of hydrogen gas, right? So one mole of hydrogen gas, when it reacts to form water, will release 241.8 kilojoules per mole of hydrogen, okay? Now, this is not the molar enthalpy for oxygen because oxygen is showing a half mole. But we can actually get in, once you have the energy value for a balanced reaction, you can actually get the molar enthalpy for everything here. Because if this number is for half of oxygen, right? So half of oxygen is negative 241.8 kilojoules. Well, if I want to know what it would be for one mole worth of oxygen, I would have to double it, right? I would double the energy as well. So for one mole worth of oxygen, basically it would be double this amount of energy, okay? So this is what I mean by, um, or I mentioned how it could be a reactant or a product. So for this number, this is the molar enthalpy for water and for hydrogen. But if we were referring to oxygen, we would have to double this quantity. So the molar enthalpy in a chemical reaction really is applicable to anything that has one mole worth. What happens if you don't have one mole worth, if it's a different number, you would have to adjust this accordingly.